eyesight is unfortunately. And that the particular reaction is that my eyesight basically shuts down. Oh, is that for the Eve? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Greenroom. Ready. Is tech ready for us? Are you ready? We're ready. Uh, just checking, are you happy with the microphone? Can we hear you? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I think I can hear you. Either that <laughs> or I'm imagining in a delirium in a state that it's working and I can hear you. Amazing. If it is, do I want to believe the delusion? Shall we begin? If you're ready. We're ready. I would like, hello. Hello and welcome. I would like to welcome all of you to the British Science Fiction Association Lecture. I'm Shana Worthen, the administrator of the lecture series, which was founded in 2009 by Dr. Tony Keane. The BSFA Lecture is intended as a companion to the George Hay Lecture, which is presented at EasterCon by the Science Fiction Foundation. Where the Hay Lecture invites scientists, the BSFA Lecture invites academics from the arts and humanities because we recognize that science fiction fans aren't only interested in science. The lecturers are given a remit to speak on a subject that is likely to be of interest to science fiction fans, uh, which really means on whatever they want. <laughs> Although the general <laughs> attention <laughs> community, this year we have an exception a rare exception, due to scheduling challenges in arranging this. I am delighted that Dr. Farah Mendelssohn has generously agreed to give this year's lecture at fairly short notice. Um, it is a lecture she has already given, a, a given recently uh, in Florida at ICFA. The, the International Conference for the Fantastic and the Arts. Dr. Mendelssohn is a scholar of science fiction and fantasy literature who trained as a historian specializing in Quaker relief work during the Spanish Civil War. Since then, Farah has gone on to write numerous monographs and edited collections, including Rhetorics of Fantasy, Children's Fantasy Literature, an Introduction, co-written with Michael M. Levy, and The Intergalactic Playground, a Critical Study of Children's and Teen Science Fiction. In addition to studies on Diana Wynne-Jones, Joanna Ross, and Robert A. Heinlein. Heinlein. Farr has taught at Middlesex University and at Anglia Ruskin University, amongst others, and is the first speaker in this series to have won a Hugo, in addition to the World Fantasy Award. Frequent convention and conference organizer and volunteer, including this year's Head of Dealers, Farah is also co-chair of the 2024 EasterCon bid, which is providing these lovely chocolate Easter eggs, which do feel free to help yourself, and they're around the convention. We will be taking questions at the end, both here in person and on Discord, for anyone following the streaming of this. Um, and a reminder that if it is possible, reasonable for you to do so, to please wear your masks while listening. Thank you very much. Today, Farah will be speaking to us on science fiction communities in the Rainbow Age. Yeah. Thank you all. Before I start, I just want to say, as well as Easter, it's actually Pesach. Um, in the interest of diversity, I'm going to teach you all to wish us a happy Pesach. 
and what you say is Hag Sameach. So after three. One, two, three. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so this is a talk that was written for other people, and I have not had time to revise it for this occasion. So you will have to slightly bear with me that it's aimed at academics, and I will tell you that it came with an agenda. The International Conference of the Fantastic in the Arts has experienced huge diversity turnover. When I started attending in the mid-1990s, I think, it was about 70% male, and there was a massive age gap in which myself, Andrew Butler, and Mark oh. Bond as in the next people up were 10 years older. And I think it's fair to say that we had a difficult time, and I probably had the hardest time because I was female very white organization with a very straight-laced idea of what we should be talking about. The organization as it exists today looks radically different. So when I put this talk together, I was challenging that last resentment of turnover. So some of this won't be so relevant for you because I think the Fanish community is further along in that big turnover and new diversity and taking it on board and thinking about what that means for us. But there are still some things I want to talk about. One of the issues is that because of the ownership of ideas are often appropriated as physical property and there's yet another row going on in the States right now because a white woman has tried to claim black women's theology, which is truly bizarre, I've actually worked quite hard to use own voices. And please note that if I do cite something from social media, Twitter, Facebook, I have, knowing the vulnerability of marginalized people to social media harassment, sought and obtained permission to quote. So I've tried to approach this paper from something that's becoming a big issue in academia about ethical academia. How do you work ethical, ethically? And the other thing is that this talk's ended up focusing on sexism and spending far less time on other marginalization. Now that's actually a reflection of the close to total omission of marginalized voices from many of the critical texts I'll be discussing. So it's not that I'm missing them, but there is genuinely a limit to how many times I can say, and there are no black people in this volume, there are no black writers talked about, nobody talks about being queer, okay? Also, most of the texts I look at were produced before people started talking about gender identity, so I just have no way of knowing, and I've not even tried. If somebody is described as female, I've just accepted that e for the context of the time, even if I have a feeling they would not necessarily identify that way now. Right, off. Sorry, paper. Um, the title of the talks, taken from a throwaway line by A.C. Greenblatt on the 22nd of December 2021, um, science fiction in the Rainbow Age described something I've been trying to say for a while that far from fragmenting into niches as some mourn, we've never actually been stronger. But that the notion of one single community, if it ever did exist, is untenable, and that we need to understand ourselves as an overlapping, intersecting, continually changing, and flowering bouquet of interests, experiences, and identifications. I originally called this pa um, paper the rainbow bouquet of science fiction, and I still quite like that image. Um, what, crit cat, what critic Kat Tanaka Opnik has described as a prismatic community. And what I'm going to talk about today, oh sorry, have I gone too fast to have, sorry, let's go there, is convention runners, academic histories, companions, monographs, awards, anthologies, and edited collections. And what I hope will go into the final published paper, which will be online because the JFA is going online, and which will be very long indeed, will include conventions and conferences. But I just ran out of time. This paper took three months as it was. Um, it's not a hugely insightful or theoretical talk. It's mostly a set of observations. So, to begin where I begin, with fandom. My definition of fandom for the purposes of this talk, and in other contexts I'd use a different definition, and note here that I am engaged in curating. I'm going to be using the term curating a lot. 
relates to the set of activities that we know as science fiction conventions. Amateur run, pay to play with few traditions of formal exclusion linked by a specific history of convention running to the history of magazines and the fanzines. It circles around WSFUS, the World Science Fiction Society, an organization that, for those of you who don't know, has very little actual authority other than that of granted to it by consensus, um, calls for WSFUS to do something, uh, generally don't understand what it can and can't do. It's a community all of its own. It's got its own areas on the internet, a mailing list for SMOF, Secret Masters of Fandom, an in-joke, but these are the people who tend to dive in to rescue a world con in trouble, the journeyman of fandom, a relatively recent split, up, split off of younger convention runners who tend to be more interested in and supportive of things like codes of conduct and panel parity. It has its own apocryphal and written histories, some published like Sam Moskowitz and Pete Weston, others stored in fanzines, now digitized, and on the fancyclopedia. Um, one way to think of it, it's a history in which the Worldcon chairs are our kings and queens, winners of fan funds are our ambassadors, the conventions are our exchanges, the fanzines are great literature. It's a community which considers itself welcoming and inclusive, and in many ways it is, and a lot of the time here I'm going to be offering criticisms that I do not wish to be seen as hostile, okay? But it demonstrates frequently that it curates its membership precisely through its understanding of what fan history is. It reminds me at times of a university department I was once peripherally associated with, in which the only kinds of history worth teaching were high politics, and never once acknowledged that this filtered out everyone but public school educated white men. It's a community that's got a bad habit of testing its members to check that they're the right kind of fan. Um, Twice in the few weeks before the, I gave this paper, I saw once to me and once to someone else, seen respondents react to questions with either how can you possibly not know that, or, and this really threw me, with a presumption of ill intent, which was odd. It's a community that presumes that its understanding of fan history is the very definition of fandom. They are fans of fandom itself, for whom Fiawol, Fandom is a way of life was coined, and I'm probably in the borderlands of this fandom, so I don't regard myself as innocent. And one consequence was that just after the Worldcon in DC, when the author L.D. Lewis suggested on Twitter that, and I'll need to quote this, when accepting people for programming, have them list five titles they've read by living authors in the last decade, there was quite a lot of umbrage on the net. But actually, for me, it struck me as rather a good idea. There'd been another comment before the convention from Laurie Mann, who some of you know, a Wellcon Worldcon runner, which she later retracted, that there was no fan programming. And it led to a storm, what I thought was a storm in a teacup, about whether or not new fans should be schooled in fanish history. Now, there were actually two issues. First of all, we'd had terrible trouble actually filling old-time traditional fan history panels. It existed, they fell by the wayside because those fans weren't traveling. But also, there were fan panels. They just weren't the right kind of fan panels. And it became quite clear to me that some, actually I'll move on to that panel, um, that some fans have a very great investment in an understanding of the community's history that begins with the first fanzines, runs through the letter columns, culminates in the first world con, and expands from there. They have an idea that the history of fandom that seems that is like a, a set text. Knowledge of it qualifies you to be a fan. But for me, looking round, the history of fandom of that kind seems to me ever more divorced from modern fandom. It focuses on a terribly narrow set of court politics. So when someone suggests that knowledge of fan history is important, it's not that I don't agree with them, because actually I do, but increasingly I'm coming to wonder which fan history they mean. Because from my perspective as a historian, as a so sociologist, as essentially a Marxist, I think 
fan history is actually ready for a real revolution. Sorry, that's not coming with me, is it? As stark as that of the Marxist turn in history in the 1930s and the post-colonial challenges of the 1980s and 1990s. And some of this has been offered not by the fan historians, but by the authors and fanzines who are not linked to the old school fandom and who have rather different profiles. Ngoyen, N.K. Jemison, Natalie Lurz, and their speeches and commentary. Um, and need to be more fully recognized, I think, as challenges to the monolithic, hegemonic, historical narratives of fan history that are still being presented as neutral. Live journal, podcast, Twitter, and new conventions, all of which, as I said, I, I hope to discuss in the published paper, have all challenged this traditional court politics of fandom. And this led me to start thinking about this process of curation all the way through. And at this point, I'm going to put down the paper because this bit I know better. That's the bit that I didn't deliver at ICFA, okay? Because it's not really them. When we ask what we're interested in, we depend on what people have produced before. And this is where I decided to go take a look. I had a look, and on the left-hand side, you've got some very old histories. Bailey's Pilgrims Through Space and Time, Amos's, A Kingsley Amos's New Maps of Hell, Moscovitz's Explorers of the Infinite, Aldous's Billionaire Spree, Del Rey, World of Science Fiction, Class and um, Some Kind of Paradise. And the last one I included is Edward James's. Well, and for those of you who don't know, he's my husband, so he's going to get just as much stick as everybody else. Okay? Um, and on the right-hand side are the modern ones. And I decided I needed to take a look at the way they curated our history and just do a bit of number crunching. And the basic issue is that they're terribly, terribly... Anglo-centric, which we know, and very prejudiced against women. Um, just to give you an example, in Bailey, he has 33 names cited. There's one woman. It's Mary Shelley. Amos, 51 authors cited. One woman, Mary Shelley. Moscovitz manages two, but oddly enough, all the chapters are named after the author he's talking about, except for the Mary Shelley one. And I, that's just odd. I can't explain it. Aldis is our breakthrough. 77, 10 female authors. And I don't think that's any surprise. Um, those of you who actually knew Aldis is that he was very fond of women in multiple ways, but that included as friends. Okay? Del Rey, 9 out of 64. Clareson, 4 out of 32. James, 16 out of 103. We never get much above 20%. But by, really, the 1970s, any chapter talking about contemporary science fiction should have been comfortably up at 33. And when I started looking at this more closely, one name really stood out as being omitted. And this is going to be true of all texts. Um, it's ironic that Edward is one of the people who omitted her because he went on to write a book about her. Loey McMaster Bujold is completely ignored. And if she gets in at all, she gets in as a fan, not as a writer, which is interesting in itself. Um, they choose their topics. These settle down remarkably quickly. Um, utopias, discovery, invention, economic change, biological transformation. The improvement of humanity, which positive eugenics, we were talking about this on the panel this morning. All of these topics are still with us today. It's quite interesting how quickly critics and fans, because particularly with the, the people on the left, the overlap is total, which is not true of the people on the right, settle down on what they agree science fiction's about really fast. Um, but the number of women does jump a little bit when we look at the people on the right. Roger Luckhurst, in his book on science fiction in, six, in 2005, and it's not a book I like, manages 19 women out of 63, but the first one's on page 143. And I have given him grief. Um, Adam Roberts, The History of Science Fiction, 15 out of seven, uh, 79. It's not until Bold and Vint that we get 70 out of 179. It takes till 2011 to start representing women in the field, both in terms of their numbers 
and their importance. Um, the writers, the writers oh, sorry, I won't bother with Vinch, she basically repeats those numbers in her later book. The citations for writers of color is incredibly sparse, 19 names across all of the books cited. Delaney appears first in Aldous, which again, not a surprise. Um, he's joined by Octavia Butler in the Luckhurst. Bald and Vint offer 14 names. In the 2012 book, no, that doesn't make sense, it must be the 2011, um, POC authors are 7% of authors mentioned. When she curates that for the 2014 book, sorry, the first one is a 2011, the 2014 book is a, a shortened version of it. She keeps POC authors to a greater degree, so they take up 14%. And Aldis is the first to include at least one woman for every period discussed. And it's Aldis who assembles the trinity of the big three. Le Guin, Russ, Tiptree Jr. Butler's not yet really a big name at that point, so that seems reasonable. Um, the one thing that doesn't, hasn't changed, though, is who's writing these books. Histories of science fiction are written by men. And I realize the obvious one to that is I ought to write one, but life's short. Um, I'm going to skim through the companions, but we hit a similar issue. Now, what is a companion? A companion is a big collection of essays, often starting with general ones, getting more specific, designed for students, often sold to general readers. The bigger ones, though, are so expensive that they tend to sit in libraries. The first of these companions was myself with Edward, and David Seeds came out in 2005, Mark Boll 2009, Rob Latham 2014, um, Garrett Canavan and Link 2015. That's where it gets slightly interesting because the Cambridge history of science fiction is not a companion but looks like one. And there's a new one coming out in 22, which addresses many of the issues I'm about to mention. We know the academic canon is different to the fan canon. And in fact, this paper is about to be cited by somebody who knows that, but couldn't find anybody who'd written it down. So I have written it down. Um, but it is quite noticeable that certain really big names are missing from all these books. Bujold, Strauss, and Scalzi scream out at you if you are a fan as how are these people not being even mentioned by academics. But let's look at the breakdown again. Um, the percentage of female contributors. CUPSF in 2003, 38%. Blackwell in 05, 28%. Routledge in, in 09, 33%. Oxford, 22%. CUP USF, US, US yeah, American Science Fiction, 47%. And the CUP history, which I'd been promised was much better, came out at 31%. <laughs> we did ours in 2003 when we were having to work quite hard without the internet web pages, etc., where you could simply surf for people. I mean, frankly, now I look for contributors and peer reviewers, I go straight to academia.edu. You know, there'll be interesting people that we didn't have that and still we're hovering around the 30 percent now this was the point that i looked around and i asked the men at ICFA to stand up i'm not going to do that to you the look of shock on some of the older men's faces as they realized they were less than 40 percent of the room was a joy okay <laughs> I'm not going to be pretend to you, it was the best moment of the talk because they had not realized they're now in the minority. But if they're now in the minority, why are they the ones dominating these books? Well, the basic issue is friends invite friends to write for these books. And when I also looked at who got invited multiple times, and sometimes multiple times in the same book, writing chapters for which I could think of far more suitable people to write for them, it was always the men, okay? And, and this is one thing that one needs to be careful about. All academic and fiction collections can have an element of nepotism. Uh, this is true when you go and look at some of the older years bests in particular. People aren't necessarily correct, um, curating to best, they're curating to who they know. Uh, and this is a factor. How am I doing for time? 
Um, OK, I'm going to skip quickly on. So I was very surprised. But academic editing is as much a, an exercise in making community as fiction editing is. Um, I don't have slides for this because I've only just done the work. Brian Atterbury asked me to take a look at teaching anthologies. So I took a look at the Hall of Fames. Well, I'm sorry, but from my perspective, they were an intervention in the field which seriously skewed our field to white men because that's the point in which a lot of older women writers got erased. I took a look at um, Jim Gunn's From Heinlein to Here, which I used for many years, which only managed about 20% women. Um, Judy Merrill, Joanna Russ, Le Guin, Tiptree, the kind of people you'd expect, but also C.L. Moore and also Leigh Brackett. The Wesley antholo Wesleyan anthology, and here's where it gets tricky because you can't really criticise people when they've started at like 1900 and come through to the present day, managed 30% female, very much oriented to post-1960s. So once they got past about 1970, it was about 50-50. But the really good one, oh sorry, I missed out Atterbury. Atterbury had done the Norton anthology. And he managed a third, but he said they'd had to fight because the publishing editor accused him of making up some of the female names on the grounds there couldn't be that many women writers, which I thought was hilarious. But the really impressive one is the Vandermeer um, uh, big book of fantasy, classic fantasy, in which he managed a female writer from every decade from 1800. That is very impressive. And by the time you got to the end, that was, he, he, it was 50-50 all the way through. So I was very pleased with that. Um, we make community in many ways. And then we'll move on to the bits that you're more interested in. Academia is my thing, it's not yours. I want to, oh, sorry, one last point. The other problem with those companions is that the chapters that were a historical overview were overwhelmingly written by men. So the overviews were male, okay? I'm going to skip the next slide, because really you don't care, um, and start talking about awards, which you probably do care about. I decided to take a look at awards, because it's well known that awards are a mode of community building. And there are, probably do without notes for some of this, there are ways of creating community through awards. You, you set up an award to get people talking about a specific thing, or you get set up an award because you as a community want to recognize things. And I, no, I will use my paper. Um, I wanted to think about how this is done. One thing I'm going to mention right at the beginning, in her introduction to her 2018 collection, How Long to Black Future Month, Jemison notes back in 2002, science fiction claimed to be the future fiction of the future, but it still mostly celebrated the faces and voices and stories of the past. All I had to do was open a magazine's table of contents or see a publisher's web page to see how few female or foreign names were in the author's list. In the same anthology, Walter, Walter Mosley wrote, everywhere I go, I meet young black poets and novelists who are working on science fiction manuscripts. Within the next five years, I predict that there will be an explosion of science fiction from the black community pretty much on time, I think. They both nailed that. It's come astonishingly fast. From 2000 to 2010, there was never more than one woman shortlisted for the Hugo Best Award Best Novel. And then things changed. And why is complex but electronic communication, and in particular social media, showed people how many others there were like them, us, and supported the kinds of conversations that once took pl place slowly in the fanzines or at conventions at high speed in things like the race fail conversations, which have been detailed by Robin Reed and which were game changers, and ele electronic publishing, which uh, made it much easier to publish and make, crucially, make that material available because you could actually start a magazine online. Neil, Strange Horizons, wave, game changer. Um, and I'm not the only one. The latest Mike Ashley book pinpoints Strange Horizons as their game-changing magazine. Uh, then produce an e-book, circulate, all far more available than print magazines. 
but crucially, I think, persuade people to nominate for awards and to talk about it widely who's worthy. In 2013, I was sent to Wiscon to recruit for Worldcon in 2014, and I was truly shocked at how many people there said, we don't care about the Hugos, it's none of our business. I would suggest that the influx of Wiscon fandom into the votings made a big difference. In 2011 and 2016, three women were shortlisted for the Hugo Best Novel. In two thirds, sorry, 2010, two, yes, I got that right. 2017, four, three in 2018, and five in 2019. In 2020 and 2021, the entire Best Novel category was female. Um, as we know, N.K. Jemison was a, a major element of that. Now, part of this is, of the issues, is how awards are constructed. Um, did any of you follow the very public collapse of the Romance Writers yeah. Award? Okay, for those who didn't, some of the problems was flat out racism, but some of the problem was the way the award was constructed, whereby regional chapters made nominations that had to be passed forward. And what that did was to depress black voters. Uh, I don't mean as in tablets, I mean in, as in voter suppression, essentially, okay? So minority voices weren't being heard, and in particular, Christian Midwestern voters were being disproportionately represented. And one of the phenomena of this is Indian bounty hunter falls in love with native woman and, fall, and renounces his crimes. Um, Nazi falls in love with beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed Jewess and renounces his crimes. That's an actual plot, by the way. That's real. That one is real, okay? Uh, there's another one out this year. So they imploded. Um, we have a lot of different awards and we talk about them a lot. They started with the Hugos in the 1950s and the latest is the Ignite Awards, founded in 2020. Most of our awards are centred in the US, and our, my pie chart, which you can't see, but I'm happy to circulate um, the, the slides afterwards, gives you this sense. American awards are unusual in that they're relatively open. I'm sorry, they tend to be, you tend to be eligible from any country. Awards in, that represent other countries tend to be closed. I don't need to explain to this audience why it's fairly straightforward. There is a divide between, mem between member voting and jurid, and I was interested to see, oh sorry, I'm struggling a bit with the microphone, I apologize, that there is a surge in jurid um, awards in the 1970s through to 2000s. And that seems to be a pushback very often where a group of people decide that the member award isn't going to the right person. And we see a lot of that. So bluntly, the Clark Award exists because people feel that the BSFA isn't doing the right thing. Okay? My stance is all of these things represent segments of fandom and I'm cool with all of them. Um, do do. I was quite surprised that awards numbered, named for a member of the community are actually in the minority, a mere quarter of the total. Superficially, I, did, I didn't guess that at all. With the exception of the Hugos, it's not really a thing until the 1980s. And then there's a cluster, including the Philip K. Dick, the Clark, the Vogel, the Chandler, the Tiptree, now renamed. And most of the named awards are jurid. Only one of the awards named in the 21st century, um, the Robert Heinlein, has been named for a person. Uh, also the Andre Norton, which is a subcategory of the Nebulas. And one, the, two, the Astounding Award has been stripped of its non... Ugh, I can't say the word has been stripped of its original label, having begun life as a John W. Campbell Award. And of course, the Tiptree Award has been renamed the otherwise. And I'm not here to discuss the rights or wrongs, but the point is that that is reflection of the community engagement and a shifting sense of who that Fanish community is and who needs to be represented. Now, I was on the investigatory committee to explore the possibility of a YA Hugo. And when we decided it should stand alone. There was a lengthy discussion about names. The short version of the conclusion was that choosing the name was a hostage to fortune and changing attitudes. And I suspect other teams on other new awards have come to the same conclusion. I, mean, I won't tell you the, the, key, the, the lead name, but it was somebody whose 
religious attitudes had the potential to cause a lot of pushback, even though they were really, really popular by, and seen as a modern writer. Um, so I think we did the right thing when we chose the Lodestar. Awards are a process of what James English calls taste management, and I really do like that term, and I'm causing curating. I'm going to, I'm aware of time, so I'm going to skip over my discussion of the different awards and talk instead about what happens when you think the award isn't doing the right thing. Because we've had a couple of awards that have actually decided precisely that. One of them is the Locus Award. Okay? In 2008, or 2007, the Locus Award decided it was being gamed. I can't remember the full details of this, but the Locus Award is one of the most open awards, or was. Anybody could vote. And it started to become quite obvious that when a really big name writer hit the, 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 the nomination lists, or when somebody with a good fan club hit the nomination lists, somebody was actively encouraging people to vote because they were voting just one thing. Okay? So they decided that they would change it so that subscribers get one vote and non-subscribers get a 0.5. And to a degree, it has had the desired effect. But at the time, it was very controversial indeed. Um, Neil, was this you or was this somebody else who did this calculation? Okay, we're not sure. Okay, somebody called Neil <laughs> basically took, took a look that year at how it affected the vote, and it did affect the vote. It, re it curated to come out with a different winner. And it was quite controversial, but it's now settled down and nobody thinks twice. But it came up for me personally a couple of years ago because I edited a book um, essentially is my last gift to my friend Mike Levy. I finished his book off. And we got a Locus nomination. But we had 150 contributors. And the book cost £100. And I, I happen to know how many people vote in the non-fiction category. It's only around 250. And I got some pushback from a couple of contributors, but I actually felt it was unethical to accept the nomination. If the book had been 20 quid, yes, because then anybody could have gone and bought it, but 100? So that was a piece of self-curation on the basis of this the way this award worked. Had the book got a Hugo nomination, it didn't, I'd have accepted the nomination because within the parameters of the way the Hugo Award works, and the fact that we sent out a Hugo package, it would have, even if the nomination had been gained, I would have felt cool that that would have been rectified by the award winners. So these are ways in which we think about this. Um, the other one I was involved in was the change to, in the BSFA nomination process in 2015. I was the awards officer. Um, so the old process, all members nominated, shortlist drawn from the round result. The novel category was overwhelmingly male. The short story category, you could get on it with three nominations. And that became an issue when a couple of people got that third nomination from a partner. Nothing illegitimate about it, okay? And I do want to emphasize that. I'm not accusing anybody of cheating. But we, what I was, had done just a few years recently was a big piece of research on children's science fiction when I'd asked people two questions. What did they remember reading, and did, had they read any of a named list of writers? And I'm sorry, blokes. But on the first question, all men, all men, only named men. But when I asked them if they'd read it from a list, they ticked women's names, okay? So what we did was have an all-year-round crowdsourcing page. All members can nominate, and you just need one nomination to get on the long list. And that, that long list is offered to, to members to select from the shortlist. And men do now nominate to that because they nominate as they read, not when they think about it six months later. We now have a diverse long list. All shortlist nominations are now receiving around eight, eight votes, which is not bad for a small pool. And the winners are split evenly between men and women. In 2022, 
I wrote this just before the list came out. Men are a minority of the nominees. We have our first African nominee and a thoroughly diverse list. This is a deliberate curation of the community. Okay? And we did it to produce something new. Um, I may not go, I probably won't go on to the last of the slides, so I think there's one more area I'm going to talk about, and that's what's happening at the moment, which I'm uncomfortable with, but again, I'm going to say there is a difference between my personal distress, and I am distressed about this, and whether this is legitimate. This is perfectly legitimate. A couple of years ago, it was decided by Westfest to set up a committee to look at all the Hugo categories. And for the first year and a bit, this took place on email, and I was part of that discussion. And then in 2021, it moved to Discord. And we weren't really consulted. We were just told it was moving to Discord. And suddenly, it's taking place on a platform that I personally can't follow. Uh, it ha conversation happens in real time. It pings up constantly. By the time I want to respond, we're 20 comments on. And the other thing I started to notice, and I did go, the reason I've done this, and all you have to see is what's in bold, um, is I was seeing the same names all the time. Whereas in the email discussions, different groups had different names who were often stakeholders in that area. So if you look at this one, on the left is the email group, and on the right is the Discord group. And only three names made the transfer, okay? Everybody else just got left behind. This is best related work. On the original group, there are several people who are regularly eligible for best related work. On the Discord group, they're gone, okay? So then I looked at the two areas that I can see. I can't see all the Discord, the Discord threads because I only signed up for two. I looked at best series, which I was very heavily involved with, ironically because I don't f actually like series fiction but felt an injustice was being done, and this is only half a joke. The series fiction email group used to write 3,000 word emails and finish them saying, and I'll carry on in the next post. <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, but it was quite a slow group. And then on the right, you can see again, no overlap or hardly any. And in terms of the conversation, all the earlier conversation has been disappeared. Um, one comment has been made by the one overlap on this, Joshua Cronengold, that I know to be incorrect. Okay? But there's nobody there to correct him except me, and I've already missed it. But again, nothing illegitimate about this. So I, this is where I got really uncomfortable. I went and looked at the participants in the Discord across the categories I could access easily. You don't need to look at the names. I could have deleted the names, in fact. All you really need to look at is the fact that it's the same names over and over again. And when I looked at the ones I know, there are a couple of conventions that specialize in, in fanzines and traditional style fan history. And it's as if we'd handed over the Hugo conversation to that group. And that, I think, is problematic. So there's nothing wrong with any individual. And I wish to emphasize, everybody here is a person of goodwill. Okay? Many of them are my friends. But we have, by moving from one platform to another platform, we've done the equivalent of moving from a cafe to a pub. It's had a curatorial effect, or taking it from the ground floor to upstairs. And when we're thinking about the diversity of our conventions, there is one non-white person on this. That's a radically different direction from the way actually everything else is going. So there is a problem. Now, I'm just going to show you some quick slides and I'm going to stop to make a little time for questions. One of the things I decided I was interested in is overlaps between different awards. And all I really want to point out to you here, if you look on the left, you will see the locus. The Locus nomination normally comes out before everything else, and it seems to feed other awards. So that's novels. Um, on the far right is the Ignite, 
is the other way, otherwise, doesn't affect that at all, hardly affects the ignite. Again, um, you can see Locus, Hugo, Nebula, Ignite. You can see we're going popular, curated popular, very curated popular, completely different set of curation. Make sense? Different reflections of community. And the exception, but this is not true this year, is the YA Award. Last year, there was close to no overlap with other awards. This year, there is. Okay. I'm going to stop there and not cover anything else because I could keep going for another hour and that would really bore you all. Thank you for your patience. For those who don't know, I'm really deaf. We need microphones and if necessary, Shana will tell me what's been said. Thank you very, very much, Farah, for that wonderful lecture. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. We will be taking them on both Discord, which Neil over here has generously agreed to monitor, um, and as well, there should be a rover with a mic, um, which we can use right here um, for anyone with questions. Oh, Neil, ask me something awkward to kick us off. Go for it. And then I think Jeff has a question. Yes, Neil and then Jeff. I suspect the answer to this is no, but have you, louder, okay, have you had a chance to look at the curatorial effect of the Locus Awards over time and compare like the 90s or 80s to now, because I suspect it's become more curatorial as the field feels to have got bigger. It has, so the Locus shortlist is essentially just recommendations from reviewers. They have been a lot more careful about the reviewers they use, but there was a, a I've got, again, I've got mixed feelings about this. I won't name the author. An author got really upset because they hit every nomination list but didn't get recommended by Locus. Now, I kind of feel nobody has a right to get nominated. Um, it's a great irony. Rhetoric's a fantasy. Got no fantasy nominations, all science fiction nominations. You can't win them all. But I did kind of get where she was coming from. What, one of the things people don't realize is that Locus reviewers choose the books they're going to review they're not told what to review. So there's several layers of curation going on. However, in terms of popular pushback, and I, I can only speak for my own category, it's the only one I has, have paid casual attention to, the best related pretty much went on sales figures for the past few years in terms of who actually wins. So it swings and roundabouts. But yes, that's a question I probably need to ask. What I would say is that under Charles, it was heavily curated in very specific ways, which very much excluded anything vaguely popular. Um, he was very supportive of capital D diversity, but less supportive of diversity of genre. Jeff? I'm fascinated to see the, uh, the crossover when you moved on to Discord. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts uh, about why that happened. Uh, was it to do with access to technology? Was it to do with the kind of people who use Discord? They're more into conventions anyway? That's what? pretty much it. Um, the people who have taken to Discord tend to be con runners. They use, we, a lot of con runners use Slack and Discord for organizing. I, they tend to be people I happen to know have spare time and can respond in real time, advantaged by being on the eastern seaboard. Um, they're also just, okay, this is an odd thing to say. I can't prove anything here. I know nothing about most of these individuals. But it did strike me as a very weird platform for us to be using when so many of us are neurodivergent and struggle with information overload, to be using a platform that if you don't turn the damn thing off, beeps at you constantly. I kept it on my phone for I think a week and just could not deal. So there is very definitely, it is curated to a set of people who like this technology. Now, who am I to say that's wrong? But I can see that it's had an effect that I think is of concern, and that's as far as I want to go because I do not want to diss very hardworking people. Does that make sense? So there's a, there's a, a problem here. For me, it's actually, the equivalent actually is union meetings during babysitting hours. Mm 
Do you have your hand up, John? No. Yeah. Oh, just scratching the ear. Oh, okay. <laughs> I feel scratching your ear should be a fan activity. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Um, I was attending a panel earlier which was about um, twisting tropes and it was a very young or female um, panel p of people who identified as LGBTQIA. Could you slow down just a little bit? Of course, sorry. Um, it was interesting they were talking about the way in which their work was curated by publication. And if we're looking at the ways in which things are presented to us, there was a feeling that female, um, trans, LGBT plus authors were curated into YA. And it's interesting that this is the slide that you've ended up on. And looking at it, I can see that that's quite a, a diverse yeah. range. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the ways in which publishers perhaps funnel their diversity into work pitched at younger people rather than what we might term serious adult science fiction and fantasy. So this goes back a long time. Both Edith Nesbitt and Noel Stretfield were more or less coerced into children's literature. The fact that they did brilliantly and made money doesn't alter the fact that for a long time we lost their adult novels. Louisa May Alcott as well. Um, okay, so actually I don't think we can put LGBTQ in quite the same category. But yes, there is that problem. Is it a problem? Let's call it an issue because I don't think it's necessarily a problem that we're getting some fantastic YA stuff. It is different for LGBTQ authors because there is quite a lot of censorship going on um, in the States, removal of books, in the UK, cancellation of school visits. So we've got a problem here too. Oh gosh, I'm trying to think about this. I'm going to say something slightly different and it, it's tricky for me because I actually don't like romance in my science fiction. One of the tropes that has come to define modern YA, and Gilly may argue with me, Gilly Bahelel, Israeli translator, wonderful YA person, just here for the day, don't miss her, is sex in science fiction has become a YA thing, and therefore it has become an LGBTQ thing. Does that make sense? So it's more about where sex in science fiction is allowed or actively encouraged. Actually, I can give you an example of a book that I didn't like, but is much lauded. The new Charlie Jane Anders, I can't remember the title. I think it's on the Hugo list. I can't hear, but... Victory is greater than death. Oh my God, I got so bored with the one-to-one -one relationships and relationship drama. I had the same problem with uh, jo uh, Scalzi's Zoe's War years back. I didn't read science fiction for that. So there's a whole discussion around that in which that has become a place that LGBTQ writers have found a place they can write about sex and relationships that adult fiction has tended to repel all relationships. Does that make sense? So I think it's a slightly different thing that's going on. And when it comes to uh, BIPOC writers, I actually think in part there's just a real demand to write the books they wish they'd had when they were young. So I'm, I'm a bit cautious about that one. I don't have the evidence. I have not done the research. So I think my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> no, I think it's important when we do actually say, I don't know. Um, somebody needs to do that research. It might be me as part of this, but the actual written version of this paper is 12,000 words long. Um, we've agreed to 10,000 words, and I think it's going to be about 15. So that gives you a sense. This thing's just growing, and I hope other people will build on that. I really do. Can I just say, an awful lot of the work I have published, the conclusion basically says, this is a first stab at it. Now go do something with this. And a lot of people have done much better work than me since. There's a new book coming out on children's SF. Actually, this might be interest you. Um, which directly builds on my intergalactic playground and asks many more of the questions you're asking by Emily Midkiff, K-I-F-F. -F. Um, it's coming out in June. I think it's called uh, something Space Cadet. I can't remember the title. Oh, it'll come back to me. Emily Midkiff. And then we had a question. Um, I just wanted to go back to the issue of Bujold having been banished mm -hmm. from these... Uh, I'm going to need help. 
companion things. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Shani will just repeat the question back to me. Okay, so it, it's, it's more of an observation than a question, but could, well, it is a question, could one of the reasons that she was excluded and vanished be that in the books, it was one of the first places I ever heard about, you know, I mean, and it's a very controversial term now, hermaphrodite, and then also um, changing gender, Lord Donya. So the basic question is, why don't they talk about Brujold? Is that right? Um, the question is more specific than that. The question, um, why, um, is Bujold p perhaps omitted because she um, writes about hermaphrodites um, and other non-binary non characters at the time? Maybe it would be the term now, you but see, also about um, the gender swap okay, with so Donya no, Donna. I don't think that's why. If I simply wrote down, there is this author that works on these topics, your average academic would go, give them to me. I think it's because she wrote old-fashioned space opera. I've had to point out to people that it's Bujold who takes Valerie Solanus's scum manifesto, we would all be more liberated, we would, women can't be liberated until we can stick our babies in machines and they can grow there, and makes it into a hard science fiction that extrapolates how an, a world will react to that and uses it to attack patriarchy. Okay, somebody once said to me that I could make the most radical policies sound like Tony Blair. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bujold is in the same category. She's a stealth radical. And an awful lot of academic writers just didn't read that kind of space opera and gosh rare stuff. I mean, I think I introduced you to Bujol, didn't I, Edward? Am I right in thinking I gave you Bujol to read? Okay. Okay, so no, he got it from analogue. But I remember just saying, why aren't they talking about her? So I have a, a theory of who becomes an academic subject which it uses the phrase yields to academic criticism. And the authors who yield to academic criticism are passed neatly along academic theoretical lines. Now, I don't come from literary criticism where picking your theory and stick, I'm going to be rude here, and sticking it over your text and seeing what shines through is the way you operate. I think I once called it forcing the, the glass slipper onto the poor mutilated foot. I come from history where it's perfectly okay to use multiple acad academic theories at one time. If I want to mix a bit of Marxism with some postmodernism and some empiricism, no historian's going to give me grief. And Bourgeois needs that. You can't just put a filter of feminism, or a filter of gender queerness, or a filter of Marxism over the top. It doesn't work. And I, so I think it's about that. But I realize that, again, I can't prove it, but it is quite noticeable. But the other thing I would say is the wrong kind of woman problem. And this essentially came up on Facebook when Hillary Clinton was running for president. I got very angry with certain very big name science fiction critics, and I will name them because they deserve it. Carl Friedman and Istvan Cicero Rone, who were very much, oh, we'd vote for if she was the right kind of woman, or the right kind of feminist, which I just incandescent. Um, and that ties in with the way male critics treat women in these books. Well, I mentioned that in Roger Luckhurst's book, the first woman to appear appears on page 143. It's extremely common for women and, by, and people of color to be corralled into chapters on feminism and on race. And it was Istvan's book, Seven Beauties of Science Fiction, which I otherwise adore. It's a fantastic book about how to understand the, the line by line writing of science fiction. It's a very good match for my own rhetoric's fantasy. Except there is a chapter on linguistics in which he only talks about men. And the one professor of linguistics in the field, Suzette Hayden Elgin, is in the chapter on feminism. And at that point, I lost my temper. <laughs> I wrote, wrote a review that the JFA actually re reje rejected. And, but the SFRA, no, not the SFRA, sorry, the 
New York Review of Science Fiction, a fanish publication, was perfectly happy to, to take. Because generally speaking, the fan conversation on this has been way further along. And also, I know we have our fanish squabbles. I know sometimes it can feel very unpleasant. But generally speaking, I have found fans as a group more inclined to be self-rectifying than academics are. Okay? Okay? I will stop there, shall I? Thank you, everybody. Thank you.